welcome everybody for, for the joint uh, quantum information slash quantum computation seminar and uh, colloquium of Center for Theoretical Physics. So today I have a great pleasure to, uh, uh, to introduce Tra uh, Dr. Travis Humble. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Travis is a distinguished scientist in Oak Ridge National Laboratory in, in the US. So he is actually a director of uh, uh, Quantum Computing Institute that has been established there, where on the top of it, he leads uh, uh, quantum computing, as far as, yeah, quantum computing team there. So uh, quite a lot of responsibilities. Uh, and uh, Travis did uh, his PhD in, uh, uh, in theoretical quantum chemistry uh, in 2005. Uh, so it's uh, so he came quite some way from uh, from that discipline into quantum computing and uh, yeah so I, I like upon checking his latest work so he's a like prolific scientist working different aspects in of near term quantum computing so I just mentioned characterization and benchmarking of quantum devices quantum simulation quantum machine learning and lastly uh, uh, near-term applications of quantum devices. And uh, yeah, about, I think, a mix. So he, today he will be talking about mixture of all those topics, I, I presume. So I'm, I'm very excited because uh, it's very tightly related to the topic of the grant uh, that we realized in Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the screen, the floor is yours, Travis. Uh, thanks for having me to come. Thank yeah. you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak with everyone. Um, it, it's very exciting for me. This is, this is my first time being able to uh, uh, visit Poland, let's say. And, uh, you know, of course, to, to talk with everybody. So I, so I very much look forward to the discussion today. The, the title of my talk, Accelerating Scientific Computing with Quantum Computers, is intended to motivate how we think that quantum computers may enable new types of computing in the future. I'll give a brief introduction to that, but I'll also go into some of the details about how we're trying to evaluate those quantum computers and track their performance as they become stronger, more powerful over time. Here is a view of Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Uh, this is a Department of Energy research facility. It's where I work. In fact, if you look at the laboratory, you can see that this building here is located where a lot of the material science research occurs. Up here in the hill is the spallation neutron source, one of the brightest sources of neutrons in the world. Over here on the right is the high flux isotope reactor, which is responsible for creating medical isotopes. But the center of this campus houses our high performance computing facility. And this is a critical part of how we perform science at the laboratory. It helps us use modeling and simulation to understand how all of these other activities perform. Oak Ridge is actually home to the world's most powerful supercomputer at the moment, uh, something called the Summit supercomputer. It is a accelerated computing system. It consists of graphical processing units attached to CPUs and massively parallel. It's actually one of a series over the, the last several years of supercomputers that take this type of approach to building uh, computational capability, an accelerator approach. The next system called Frontier is gonna use the same design, CPUs with GPUs attached to them. But what's beyond the Frontier is a big question at the moment. We're not sure that we can build these systems out beyond the exascale um, regime without adopting new technologies. If you look at how these computers are being used, you'll see that it's dominated by simulations of materials, chemistry, astrophysics, nuclear physics, and plasma physics. There's biology and engineering and earth science. A lot of these turn out to be uh, partial differential equations as well. But my point in this slide is to emphasize that the supercomputers are being built specifically to solve these types of physical problems. Now, of course, we've all probably familiar with this quote from Richard Feynman, that if you wanna make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. He goes on to say, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And, and that's a little bit of a, a double-edged sword. 
on the first hand, we know that if we want to perform these simulations of physical systems, quantum mechanics would be a great model in which to perform those computations. But that requires us to understand quantum mechanics in those physical systems at a level which we can control them and make, it, make them perform the way we want to. So it's a little bit of uh, two sides of a coin, and we have to be able to understand both sides of it to make this vision a reality. Now, the basic requirements of a quantum computer, um, there are some essential features. Uh, David DiVincenzo laid these out some time ago, and I'll just briefly review them. The, the first is that we need a scalable system of qubits. The qubit, of course, being the quantum bit of information. The, the system has to be able to be initialized into a known state. We have to start off with, with certainty about the state of that system. And, that's the second criterion. The third is that we need a universal set of quantum gates in order to program that system to perform the computations that we need. Finally, those gates must act much faster than the decoherence time, the, the, the rate at which the system loses coherence. And then finally, we must be able to read out that measurement, uh, read out that, that quantum state through measurement. Now, these five criteria are rather um, generic in their specification, and they can actually be implemented in a number of different models. I'll just highlight three of those here. The first I'll call digital computation, and this is largely the circuit or gate model that many people are familiar with. It's based on fast, discrete transformations of the computational state. Now you can see down at the bottom a circuit diagram where there's a register that stores the information, gates that act on those registers, and then the measurements that occur at the end. What's nice about this model is that representation translates easily into Boolean logic and has a uh, direct connection with the conventional circuits that are used in conventional computers. Now, of course, there's other ways to approach quantum computation. The adiabatic and analog models also perform transformations of the computational state. In this case, they're based on continuous time transformations. The first adiabatic is relatively slow, while the analog is relatively fast. Both of these have their universality defined by the Hamiltonian, which is being controlled. Adiabatic computation has the benefit that it's relatively straightforward to translate that into the optimization model. Here you have to imagine that I'm minimizing the energy of my quantum state so that it's finding the lowest energy state of my Hamiltonian. And that can be used to recover the solution. On the other hand, the analog model translates more easily into quantum simulation where I'm explicitly and directly controlling the Hamiltonian itself. All three of these models provide me different platforms and at Oak Ridge we're trying to understand how we can solve these original scientific challenges in computing using any or all of these different models. Of course, there are current quantum processors available today that implement some of DiVincenzo's original criteria. These QPUs are relatively small in size, anywhere from zero to 53 or so qubits. Uh, they typically have gate fidelities that are relatively high, so 99.9% .9 accurate, um, but two qubit gate fidelities that are a few percent lower. They have limited connectivity. That is to say that the qubits in the register don't all connect with each other, but they have good addressability. So I can identify where the qubits are and act on them with the gates. But because of the relatively low um, addressability, I actually have low depth sequence of reliable operations. That is to say that noise starts to overcome my use of these quantum processing units and that limits the controllability and my, my hope of running applications on them. But these are relatively early designs of quantum processing units and getting our hands on them allows us to test out the feasibility as well as explore new ideas. So many vendors and laboratories offer access. Of course, there's several uh, well-known ones, D-Wave, IBM, Google, and others. But in all of these cases, the models of access are based on a client-server interaction. So I, a remote user, am logging into a system 
submitting my program, waiting for results to come back from a separate system that runs the quantum processor, and then interpreting those results. So this is a bit like a cloud model of computing. That's very different from our current high performance computing approach. It's a very loose integration. It's not an accelerator model. It's one that we may hope to drive the design requirements of these devices, but it's not where we're at today. Instead, today we're focused more on noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, also called NISC. Now here, the, the dominating feature is that noise and errors limit the quantum computer's performance. And there's too few qubits to perform error correction, which could in, uh, perform some sort of a fault tolerance. And then there's too much noise within the bare qubits to actually have long-term stability of the device. So this does limit our implementations and testing to low depth circuits, relatively few gates, and also static designs, where here static means that I'm not using feed forward to redesign my circuit while the program is running. But again, this early access to devices actually give us some insights into the ways that we might use NIST computers for scientific computing. On the right are two examples of these types of devices. The one at the top from IBM is a superconducting transmon device composed of 20 qubits. You can see the arrows here indicating which qubits can interact with each other. So this is the connectivity. Uh, of course, it's not fully connected, so every qubit has a limited number of neighbors that it can speak to. A similar design from Rigetti is the Aspen device, a 16 qubit, uh, again, superconducting transmon device, but now laid out in these hexagonal units. And Either of these designs may have benefits or drawbacks depending on the particular application that you're looking at. So one of our goals at Oak Ridge is to understand how architecture features like connectivity influence the performance of particular applications. We wanna monitor the state of quantum processors so that we can anticipate when they may be able to influence our high performance computing capabilities. Of course, we can go back and look at DiVincenzo's original criteria, and we can ask, how do I quantify that? What's the scale of qubits? Well, you can see here IBM has up to 53. IonQ, a trapped ion technology, has claimed up to 79 uh, single qubit addressable system. And then, of course, D-Wave, another superconducting-based system, but this time in the adiabatic model, is, uh, has a register of over 2,000 qubits. The initialization fidelity and gate set fidelities really refer to the accuracy with which I can perform operations on those systems. The duty cycle here is the ratio of the gate time to the decoherence time. So I want to have a high duty cycle because that means I can perform many gates before decoherence takes it over. And then, of course, measurement fidelity, which is responsible for reading out the answer, is also measured in terms of accuracy. Swap and transport fidelity re, um, uh, relate to the idea of moving quantum information within the register. It's not always applicable. Oh, Michal. Sorry, Travis. Can I ask? So when you uh, mentioned duty uh, cycle, uh, is it with respect to two qubit gates or uh, some kind of average or single qubit gates? Oh, great question. I think when in these particular calculations, we ended up using the longest gate that was available at the time, uh, which is normally the two qubit, uh, two qubit interaction. I, I can't remember the exact numbers, that have, and the thing is that those gate times can change quite a bit um, through tuning and other features. And um, so I would think of these numbers here as more um, order of magnitude estimates. Uh, so may I also ask, uh, like, uh, how yeah. to uh, measure initialization fidelity uh, in a consistent manner? Because it's not so popular to see actually this figure of merit. Uh, like, maybe I don't see it only. Uh, people usually talk about gates and measurements errors. Um, You're exactly right. Um, so the initialization fidelity and the measurement fidelity here are very closely related to each other, um, in part because the uh, the, these particular numbers 
are have not um, removed the measurement fidelity from the initialization fidelity. So in this case, they are exactly the same. Okay, so that, think, that that makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. It is much more difficult to get the initialization fidelity directly. I think you know this, of course. But right, um, right, yeah. You need some con self-consistent way of doing all right. this stuff. That's exactly right. But the um, but but that is the approach to it. Is that if you find a self-consistent set of equations, you can isolate the measurement fidelity under certain assumptions, and then infer what the initialization fidelity would need to be. So those bare metrics are useful for understanding how the individual pieces of a quantum processor are actually um, progressing in terms of their performance. But the question about how does the integrated quantum processor perform is not directly addressed by those individual criteria. We actually need new types of tests to understand how the performance of the whole device behaves. And so we're looking at characterizing noisy quantum circuits Again, recognizing that noise is the dominant limiting feature at the moment um, as a way of characterizing quantum processor performance. And this is work that I'm doing with Megan Lilly, uh, who's a graduate student at the University of Tennessee and is, works out at Oak Ridge with me. Now, of course, there's different approaches to characterizing noise. The first, a fine-grained physics model, um, can get at the very low level details of what is actually occurring within the device. However, this typically requires a large number of resources in order to get high accuracy models. Uh, think of quantum state tomography or quantum process tomography, which grow exponentially in the size of the number of qubits in order to perform those characterizations. While that can work for a relatively small number of qubits, as these systems get larger, these fine-grained physics models are going to have trouble uh, performing efficient characterization. On the other hand, we can try to develop coarse-grained models of the physics that instead of giving us high accuracy, give us low accuracy, but perhaps that accuracy is sufficient to track progress. The benefit here is that the uh, characterization technique can use relatively few resources and hopefully stay efficient as the size of the system grows. But are there models that are coarse grained and provide sufficient uh, understanding of the physics uh, to track performance? This is the question that Meg and I set out to uh, investigate. We have only looked at relatively simple circuits. Uh, you see here on the right, the case of an in-qubit uh, GHZ state. Um, the, the, the Hadamard gate and the, the sequence of C naught gates and the measurement, it turns out that we're going to need to characterize that whole circuit in order to understand the performance of the, uh, the quantum processor. Our approach to doing that is to take the input circuit, in this case the in qubit GHC state, and decompose it into subcircuits. Now, you'll see here a set of subcircuits, each based on two qubits. So the two qubits are each being prepared in a Bell state. So instead of characterizing an in qubit state, we're going to characterize several of these two qubit Bell state. And then from those characterizations, we'll begin to understand how the whole system performs. I want to emphasize that the decomposition is a choice that we make as modelers of the system. It could be that we only needed a one qubit circuit, or it could be that we needed a three or four qubit circuit to get a good enough model. This is a step that we'll come back to when we're performing this in, um, in, in practice in order to make updates to the decomposition. Given that decomposition, we also want to look at what is the noise model that we pr uh, propose for that subcircuit. So you can see here that I have qubits one and two, um, followed by the Hadamard and identity gate. Our model has said that, well, we're gonna assume that we apply a depolarizing channel after the Hadamard gate, which reflects the fact that there's noise occurring on top of the logic performed by the gate itself. Now, the order in which the, the uh, noise is applied actually is another important choice in the modeling. Um, the fact that we applied a, a noise to the identity gate is another choice. 
each of these models that we use for noise have parameters and estimating those parameters is at the heart of the characterization step. Of course, then there's the two qubit gate, the CNOT gate. In this case, we actually again use a depolarizing model here given by the, the red epsilon, but we don't use one that's correlated. We're gonna use an uncorrelated or separable uh, pair of depolarizing channels but that are perfectly identical with each with each other. Now, this isn't, I can't tell you that this is necessarily a good model to choose for, for the CNOT gate. It depends a lot on the technology and the, um, the behaviors that we observe. And so we may come back and have to change this model in the future in order to get sufficient accuracy. But in order to keep the cost relatively low, we picked the simplest models that we could start with. And then finally, the B in this diagram represents the readout model. In our case, we're actually modeling the projection of the quantum state into the classical bits. So it combines together the measurement and the noise process. Uh, I'll talk in a moment about looking at an asymmetric readout model, which characterizes the transition from zero or one differently. We're gonna test these ideas using uh, an IBM device, uh, the Poughkeepsie device, which is uh, a 20 qubit um, superconducting device with the layout that you see here. Um, I don't believe the Poughkeepsie device is available anymore. Uh, this is actually an interesting point about the technology at the moment. While we perform these experiments and we get out nice papers about them, in a year's time, these, these systems are gone. And so it really is a mixture of computer science and experimental physics uh, in, in the sense of the, um, the, these aren't devices that I can go back and buy another version of in the future. Right, so it's actually the same with the system we used for our paper about readout noise. The, it's also not available anymore. <laughs> exactly, yeah. This, is, this has given me grave concerns about the um, reproducibility of results these days for NISC devices. Um, but it's something that I think uh, we're all facing. Right. So can I ask, so, uh, okay, semi-scientific question, like why is that? I understood that maybe this this version of like IBM computers that are like available to everybody in the cloud, they like disappear, but like such bigger devices, it's a, like, uh, why would they disappear so, so fast, let's say? Can you comment on this? Yeah, it's a good question. I, in some ways, it's not the device disappearing that, that I'm worried about. I, I, I do agree that the, as the technology gets better, we want the better devices. Um, and IBM, you know, or, or any vendor um, needs to take, take the old ones out to put the new ones in. What concerns me is that when we are performing these experiments on these devices, there's no guarantee that we could ever reproduce those experiments because it may be very specific to the device that we ran it on. Yeah, I mean, so probably in the ideal world, you would like first spend some time with the device just characterizing it and then like update your exactly. model based on the device, right? That's, That's right, yeah. Recently, um, uh, another student has begun looking at um, stability of the characterizations of these devices. So if I get out error rates for the gates and the registers, what happens over the course of several days or months? Are those error rates drifting? Do they ever go back to where they were before? And we, we are definitely seeing some differences in the statistics of the device over time, but I'm not sure yet if those differences are significant for, for reproducibility. Um, right. But, but in, yeah. So exactly. uh, we, we also observed this during our like characterization of readout noise only. <laughs> that exactly, the, over yeah. time it's changed, yeah. Uh, but maybe in our work, the important point was that uh, kind of the type of the noise didn't change for the readout. Like it was uh, hugely classical in a sense, like you have this, uh, uh, you, uh, you have this classical readout noise, right? Uh, like readout model, like this bit mm -hmm. flip stuff and the mapping to classical bits. But in general, there also might be like a POVM type of noise, like your measurements are more general and have some coherent noise. But uh, so, yeah, but we observed that like the, uh, this, uh, the, the, the fact that the noise is mostly classical doesn't change over time. 
I mean, of course, only for this device that we are checking out, but uh, yeah, um, so the type of noise didn't change, but the magnitude did uh, fluctuate a lot. So that's just some comment. What, what I would like to see in the future is that every experiment paper that uses these devices provides some characterization of these types of questions. You know, what was the noise and what was the, the magnitude? Yeah. So once we have these subcircuits and their models, we have to create a set of test circuits for each of the, the subcircuits. And what I mean by this is that I can generate a truth table for how the ideal circuit should behave. And that's gonna give me an expected output from the circuit. And then I'm gonna eventually compare that to the observed output. And the difference between those two is due to noise. Now, for an, a sub-circuit that has m qubits in it, I'm gonna require two to the m test. Uh, I'm gonna assume I'm measuring in the computational basis, and then I'm using the computational basis as my uh, set of input states. So I get two to the m, because there's two to the m possible computational states. But here, again, m is my choice as the modeler for what how large the subcircuit needs to be. For a 20 qubit GHZ state, m may actually be equal to two, because I'm using uh, two qubit subcircuits. Based on those uh, characterizations, we then estimate the model parameters uh, from this difference between the expected and observed results. And that estimation can be analytic by inverting a series of equations, or it can be numerical by inverting the, the, the matrices that are involved. I'll give you an example of the latter. For the asymmetric readout model that you can see at the right, if we're in the zero state, we project on to the zero bit with one minus P0 probability, or we have an error P0, an error rate P0 that takes us to the one state. Whereas if we're in the one state, we'll project on to zero with the rate P1 and on to one with the rate one minus P1. In the plot here, you're seeing our estimate of the readout rates P0 and P1 for all 20 qubits in the Poughkeepsie device. You'll immediately notice that the readout of the one state has a much higher error than the readout of the zero state. Uh, in general, the, the average for this is about three times uh, difference. Um, and there's also a greater variance in the readout of the one state as well. These types of parameters are important when we go and try to mitigate against readout noise in characterizing circuits. Understanding that the one states are actually noisier means that we have to provide, um, perform more noise correction on those particular bits. We next looked at the C0 gate on Poughkeepsie. Again, this is the layout of that um, device. And on the right are the estimated depolarizing noise parameters. Remember, C0 was modeled using a pair of depolarizing channels. And what we're showing here are the parameters that we estimated. In this case, we've actually removed noise due to readout from the, um, from the estimates of the expected circuits. And then analytically solved for what the depolarizing parameters should be. The different colors correspond to switching, which is the control and the target bits. You can see that there is some difference associated with that. But more importantly, there's a big difference associated with which pair of qubits that you're using to perform the CNOT gate. Uh, but uh, you, you do the switching by Hadamard gates or like some, it's some physical thing? Uh... You can actually, okay, so, so this is actually a very important point. The C0 gate itself is not implemented in IBM. You have to use the, um, the cross resonance gate and a series of rotations. And so it's exactly what you said, is that you're, you're essentially doing a different set of gates to, perf to, to switch the control and the target. Um, I'm trying to remember what the exact sequence is, but it's, um, yeah, I'll have to go back and check on this. Sure, but but sure. there is essentially a second gate, yeah. Now, given those characterizations of measurement and C0 and other gates as well, we can ask how well are we able to prepare a GHZ state on Poughkeepsie? You can see in this example, the sequence of C0 gates that implement that original um, in qubit circuit. And then on the right, 
we're plotting the total variation distance. This is a measure of distance between the observed outcome and the simulated outcome. It's the frequency with which I observe each instance of measurement. So for the case of um, all the qubits being observed in zero, there's some frequency for that, as well as some uh, simulated estimate for that frequency. I sum over all those possible outcomes, and this gives me the total variation distance, TVD. And we're plotting that here as a function of the number of qubits in the circuit. You'll immediately notice that as the number of qubits go up, the total variation distance is increasing, which indicates that our model is not as good at uh, describing that, that system. And in fact, by the time we get out to 20 qubits, we're at around a distance of 0 0.5, which is relatively large. The noiseless model, which assumes no errors in the system, is around 75% uh, or 0 0.75. So you can see that this is a substantial error. But if we go back to the lower end of that range, around the three and the four qubit system sizes, we recognize that we have relatively small error. So let's focus on that for the moment. In this system, we actually want to now take our characterization of C0 or of, of the GHZ gate and apply that to a completely different circuit. We're not gonna recharacterize this bernstein bazarani circuit, which is made up of the same gates, Instead, we're going to use our previous characterizations to estimate the performance we expect from that circuit. Uh, we ended up using four qubits. Again, this is in the, the regime of the very low noise uh, or, or high accuracy for our model. Um, and then you can see on the right, the difference between this, the experimental results of accuracy and the simulated noise. Now, let me say a little bit about bernstein bazarani circuit. So what's happening here is I'm encoding a secret string into this uh, classical uh, circuit diagram, and then I'm performing that program to try to extract out what that secret string was. The results of that are what I'm uh, terming the accuracy, the probability that I find the secret string. And that's the green bars. And you can see that for the all zero secret string, I have probably 90% accuracy. But by the time I get up to the all ones secret string, I'm down to around 55 or 60%. So there's an indication here that being in the one state is actually generating more errors in my, my experimental system. Our model only accounted for those types of errors in the measurement process. Our modeling of the C0 gate and the other gates all assumed it was independent of the state of the quantum system. We still see a slight decrease in our accuracy that mimics the decrease in the experimental system, but it's not exactly a perfect match, perhaps because we need to refine our model. So this has led us to look at a slightly different type of error model, one that is state dependent. And we haven't applied it to the bernstein vazirani example yet, but we have applied it to a, a, a routing problem. Here, I'm gonna assume I have four qubits, I'm sorry, five qubits. I'm gonna prepare the first two qubits in uh, either the zero one state or one one state, whichever choice I make. And then I'm gonna move the value of the uh, first qubit, uh, sub zero, over to the fifth qubit. And I'm gonna perform measurements to understand whether or not the value of the state makes a difference on the fidelity of moving it to that last qubit. And so the swap gates that you see here are actually directly related to the C0 gates. So this gets back at the idea of, is it the C0 gate that's state dependent? These tests were actually performed on the Boblogen device. It's a different IBM device with 20 qubits, but a slightly different connectivity. And we've only looked at the four, or I'm sorry, the five qubits in the top. Um, sorry, Travis, can you just repeat uh, the, the scheme? Okay, it's very interesting, but I think I, I missed the, the key point, sorry. Oh yeah, the, the, the part about the, the swapping? Yeah. Is that what's yeah. yeah. So over here, I have the five qubits. I'm going to use the X gates to either set, um, to, to set the value of this qubit, and, and it's going to be a parameter what I use. Um, for example, if, if I set this qubit to one, 
I'm then going to move that qubit through swap gates from here down to here and measure the fidelity with which that occurs. And I, I, can, re I can reverse that sequence too. Um, and the question will be, does it make a difference whether this is zero or one? And, and that will be the state dependent part. Oh, thanks. Of course, yeah. So when I perform that, and this is just for pairs of qubits, I can measure the transition probability. So this is the probability that given a particular input, say zero, zero, I got the correct output, which of course should be zero, zero in this case. If the input was one, zero, then I should have gotten out zero, one for the swap gate. And what I see is that the fidelity does depend on the particular state that I start with, but perhaps not in a really significant way. And what I mean by that is that these are very noisy measurements. We don't have the error bars on here, but to be between 90 and 95% probability, these are probably difficult to really say that these are different. But we're gonna, we're gonna use these characterizations to design a model that actually says that the state dependence is important. And in this, we use a four state Markov model where my two qubits can uh, be Just a, qu a quick question yes. uh, um, to understand. Uh, the readout noise here is accounted for, yes? So it's like- That's only... right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's right, yeah, we, we, uh, we had removed the readout noise for these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so my two qubits can be in one of these four states when I perform one of the C0 operations, it switches that state, but there's also probabilities to transition to any of the others. Uh, this is basically an, an, a, a bit flip model. The, um, now, the ideal logic would be to follow the blue line that you see here, and then that gives me the swap at the end. But of course, there's many different pathways to get there through this noisy system. And when we write out the expression for this in terms of this um, binary noise model, it turns out to depend on an amplitude, which is the probability to make any of these individual transitions. And that's exactly what this characterization data is telling us. What are these uh, amplitudes that go into my noise model? So we're gonna use that to, to create an, an understanding of, of how the swap program is actually working. So we do this five qubit swap program. Uh, we actually use tomography on the five qubit system, which turned out to be very expensive. Uh, this took, you know, days worth of compute time and, and millions of, of samples to get. Um, and we can see that the tomography predicts that which state you start in gives you a different fidelity. Blue, which is the all zero state is almost always a higher fidelity than red, which assumes that the two qubits have both been set equal to one. So this is, you know, clear evidence that there's state dependence in the, the errors of, of, the, of the swap gate. Our relatively simple model based on this binary noise uh, Markov state actually reproduces that behavior as well. Again, red is always the lowest, blue is always the highest, the green and the yellow are relatively similar to each other. Again, only one of those bits has been set equal to one, so maybe that makes some sense. So this type of characterization is a refinement of our earlier noise model, which is the assumed depolarizing channel, and here instead uses this classical bit flip model, but with, with state-dependent amplitudes, and that turns out to be a better, better characterization. So everything that, I've, that we've been talking about at this point has been focused on how do I evaluate the integrated performance of a quantum processor? And we took this component on idea of individual gate errors and tried to synthesize a holistic model of the circuit. And from that, we can estimate the accuracy as well as the other uh, properties of the system. But that's actually, um, still not immediately addressing what is my value for scientific computing. Now, we know that quantum computers actually have many algorithms that could be performed on them for simulation, partition functions, optimization, that directly relate to scientific computing. Problems in high energy physics, material science, and chemistry all end up depending 
on these types of uh, uh, problems, and quantum algorithms provide new types of solutions. You know, it, it was mentioned earlier, my, my PhD was actually in theoretical chemistry, but it's been 15 years since I've, uh, since I've worked in that field, which makes it very ironic for me that I'm now having to remember things about chemistry because I'm going to use that to test how quantum computers can solve those problems. In particular, quantum computers that are fault tolerant have a relatively straightforward approach to recovering their electronic structure of a molecule. The idea there is that you use unitary propagation under the Hamiltonian of interest and then perform a Fourier transform to extract out the energy of that system. It ends up being encoded in the phase because of the propagation operator. Now, this particular algorithm, quantum phase estimation, can be performed efficiently, but only if I have a fault tolerant quantum computer, something that's resilient to errors. The, the, the number of gates required to perform this algorithm is much too many to use on our current NISC computers. In fact, if you calculate the number of gates and time necessary to perform these types of uh, quantum chemistry calculations, you find out that you need anywhere from hundreds to thousands of logically corrected qubits. These are qubits that each may have um, 100 to 10,000 physical qubits representing them. So it's an enormous resource uh, and something that's not currently available. So is it possible to compare it to like the classical cost on like, with, like state of the art, like uh, algorithms, classical algorithms and computers? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, this comparison um, demonstrates uh, relative to what's called FCI, full configuration interaction, uh, electronic structure calculations, that you can get an exponential speed up using quantum phase estimation for that problem. Now, there are still some challenges beyond um, just solving the problem. Uh, encoding the data into the computer is one. Um, reading out the measurements, sampling, all of these things are still issues, but compared to the best known classical case, you can have an exponential speed up for this. But again, with a fault tolerant quantum computer. <laughs> Thanks. Now on NIST devices, there's actually another algorithm based on the variational principle, which tries to solve the, sa solve the same problem, but without that guarantee of an exponential speed up. In this approach, we use the fact that the true ground state of a Hamiltonian will always be the state that minimizes the expectation value of energy. And so that's what the expression here on the left. I have a variational state psi, it depends on a parameter theta. And if I change theta such that I minimize this uh, expectation value, then I have the guarantee that the resulting state psi is in fact the ground state of that Hamiltonian. So how do I uh, construct psi so that I can search through these different variations? Well, this is known as making an ansatz. And the way that we're gonna perform that is again, using a series of, uh, of gates, uh, transformations applied to some initial state. And from that change, which transformations we apply by changing the parameter theta. So just to give you a schematic, I have an initial register all set to zero. I apply a sequence of operations, the U sub i's to that state. I estimate its energy, applying the Hamiltonian H, and then I perform the, the readout. That estimate of energy is then compared to a threshold condition. If I've reached a value that I think is small or, or the minimum, then I'm done, and I, I read out the energy in the state. If not, I update that parameter theta and make a new state and repeat the procedure. Now, of course, this is a classical search, but using a quantum computer to calculate the cost function, in this case, the energy. This has been applied um, several years ago by IBM, looking at calculations of small diatomic molecules. On the left, you see the hydrogen molecule where the black dots correspond to the experimental data using the variational algorithm. The red lines correspond to simulations that anticipated what we expected to see from that, that system. In the middle, 
you'll notice another molecule, in this case lithium hydride, where the black dots indicate a departure from the dashed lines. The dashed lines being the, the FCI, the, the full configuration uh, expected result. And then something similar happens for beryllium hydride, a slightly larger molecule, where there's even more deviation. These blurred lines here actually represent what we anticipate to be the result if we had a truncated basis. That is to say that we didn't have really a full representation of the ansatz needed to find the minimum energy. So this has always been a curious result to me because this is just another indication of not using a sufficiently large basis in order to perform the estimate. Uh, and it's something that can only be overcome by increasing the size of the, the quantum computers. Now at Oak Ridge, we've been looking at this VQE as a benchmark for NISC devices, specifically by evaluating the quantum chemistry problems. Uh, as we discussed earlier, there's many different techniques for tuning the performance through the choice of the ANSATs, through the choice of the search, the optimization routine. Of course, there's post-processing to remove out the errors due to, uh, to measurement and the gates. Um, all of these techniques are things that we've bundled up into a, um, a programming framework that we call XACC. You can find it online at this website. The, one of the nice things about XACC is it's written to support many different types of quantum computers. It's not tied to a single vendor. By running a program through that framework, you can actually run the calculation on different quantum computers. In our case, we've performed the chemistry calculations on both the IBM device that you see here and the Rigetti device that you see down at the bottom. I'll switch over to a slightly enlarged view. For the IBM device, we're looking at sodium hydride, uh, again, a diatomic molecule, where the estimated uh, actual energy is uh, minus 160.27. The raw results from that VQE algorithm are very far away from this uh, true answer. But if we use these post-processing techniques, we can actually get very close to what the actual answer is expected to be. Curiously, the exact same thing happens on Rigetti. The raw noise in the, um, the, the results actually are very high relative to the, uh, the true ground state energy. But by post-processing, we're actually able to recover the correct result. So one metric of performance here is the difference between these two lines. By performing post-processing, I've added another classical step to my analysis of the computer. That's not something I want to do, but it's something I have to do. If the processors are improving with time, I expect the gap between the raw and the purified results to decrease, indicating that performance of those devices is actually improving. Now, we've put together an entire suite of these types of benchmarks, uh, scanning through many different types of diatomic molecules, uh, mainly the metal hydrides. We've looked at a series of different ANSATs. Uh, UCC1 is an uh, ANSAT for the quantum state based on uh, unitary coupled cluster theory. Uh, it actually tries to use a minimal sequence of the, uh, the gates, whereas UCC3 is actually decomposing the, the gates to make a similar quantum state, but uh, trying to take advantage of the, um, the original formulation. Uh, let me try to restate that. UCCC1 has actually used some compression in the, the design of the gates to, uh, to um, minimize the depth of that circuit. You can look in, in the paper, the manuscript, which has now been published, and identify that across the different IBM and Rigetti processors, that there's a relatively consistent behavior in terms of their ability to solve these types of uh, diatomic molecules using the VQE algorithm. What's going to be interesting is if in a year or two from now, we re-perform these same calculations and identify if there's been any improvement in the accuracy of these results. Uh, sorry, Travis, can I ask, I, I didn't uh, get, uh, so uh, th this part, are you using uh, VQE algorithm or some, because uh, uh, here this UCC1 or this UCC3, like those seems to be some, like uh, just some circuits that are ANSATS 
phase. So like, ah, you have many, ah, so you have optimization over many parameters here. That's right, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't do a good job explaining. Um, th this is for VQE. Okay. The UCC1 and UCC3 are the, the different ANSOT states. UCC1 has one parameter. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, the Z theta uh, with uh, Z rotation. Okay. And UCC3 this stands for this unitary parameter. coupled cluster, yes? Uh, That's right. Okay, they're, okay, they're, they're both based on that theory, but the, um, the UCC3 has the three parameters. Um, I'll tell you what was somewhat surprising is that UCC1 actually worked better. Um, or, or it worked as well as UCC3. And we had expected UCC3 to be a better one because there's more parameters. I can, I can create a greater variety of configurations. Mm -hmm. But I think what's actually happening is that the noise in the processor, there, there's a noise floor and the longer gate depth is going below that noise. And so I'm, I'm not seeing any differences even though I have three parameters. Um, so this was one of the reasons we tried the different ANSOTs was just to see what would happen in that case. Um, and I don't think the processors are good enough yet to tell the difference between these two. And a, a quick technical question. So what classical optimizer did you use actually? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, I can never remember. I always call it BFGS. Um, BFGS, yes, there is such yes. thing. Okay, cool. Yes, but I can't remember what the B and the F and the G and the S stand for, so I apologize. Right, um, right. No, no the, problem. Uh, I, I yep. am familiar. You know, and, and one of the challenges in VQE is that every point is an estimate. So you're sampling it many, many times. And then the next point that you go to, you have to repeat that. So the number of classical search steps you perform is actually the limiting piece for the, 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 uh, the performance. So coming up with a better classical optimizer is essential to um, uh, understanding how to make these systems uh, uh, perform better. But for us, it's not so much about the time complexity at the moment, just whether or not the hardware is sufficiently accurate to get the right answer. So I think I'm, I'm coming close to my time, so I'm probably going to um, jump to another section of my slideshow, if that's okay. Um, never quite sure how to do that. You know, we, we, like the atmosphere is relaxed, so, you know, if, if you, you know, you don't have to finish immediately. Yeah. Oh, okay. We, start, we started like five minutes later also. Well, I probably have about 10 more minutes of, of another topic, if, if that's okay. That's okay. That's perfectly fine, yeah. Oh, okay, wonderful. Well, then I won't skip it. Um, it it's somewhat, um, it, it's interesting to me because it uses a different uh, computing model to, to, to do the same type of analysis. Um, in this case, we're gonna look at a material science problem, uh, specifically trying to uh, simulate the phase diagram of a, a many body uh, system. There is, um, of course, in, in condensed matter physics, many body problems are, are really an important part of what, what is happening um, in, in the observation of different phases. There is a example of a, a holmium tetraboride shown here in this, this diagram on the left, uh, that when you, when you scan the applied magnetic field, you can actually drive that system through different uh, regimes of magnetization. Uh, so it can be unmagnetized initially, but then as you are uh, turning on that magnetic field, you eventually reach a transition where it goes into a fractional magnetization phase. So that is to say that the average magnetization over the system is, is one third. Uh, so out of every three spins, one of them is, is pointed uh, up and the other two are pointed down, let's say. Uh, as you increase that field, you actually uh, find other plateaus as well until eventually you saturate the system and the magnetization becomes one. So all the spins are finally pointed in the, the same direction. Now, there have been some proposals that this particular type of uh, behavior is actually due to frustration in the original um, uh, spin system and that that can be modeled using a Shasterly Sutherland icing model. So this is a classical icing model where the spins are laid out in the lattice that you see here. 
So the, the corners, the intersections correspond to the location of spins, and then the, the blue lines correspond to the uh, interactions between those spins in a square lattice. But then there's an additional set of interactions given by these dashed lines that are the diagonals. And the introduction of those actually generate a new type of frustration, um, uh, a competition between the alignment of the spins. There is already known the phase diagram of this system uh, analytically. There is a uh, ferromagnetic phase where uh, essentially all the spins are pointed in the same direction. There is a Neal phase, which ends up looking a bit like a, a checkerboard pattern. But then there is this one-third plateau phase uh, that we're going to try to simulate using uh, the quantum computer. Now, I'll just give you the, um, the punchline. We were able to recover the phase diagram. In fact, you can see that all four phases uh, show up here. And this fourth phase, the, the fraction, uh, uh, fractional um, magnetization plateau, is uh, actually in agreement with what we expect. Uh, so so I, I didn't get the size of the system uh, for that. Or? Oh yeah, uh, it, that's coming up. I promise. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but it's around uh, 500 lattice sites. Yeah, um, okay. and the reason we can do that is we're uh, this, this is work with my student Paul Carey's uh, uh, graduate student at University of Tennessee. Um, is we're going to use the D-Wave processor, which is based on the adiabatic model. And that has 2,000 um, or so quantum register elements based on superconducting uh, flux qubits. And they're laid out in a pattern like the one you see here, where the red dots correspond to the, the qubit, and then the black lines correspond to junctions or interactions between those qubits. So again, it's limited connectivity. But what's unique about this system is that after we have initialized it, we're going to drive its dynamics through the Schrodinger equation by slowly varying the Hamiltonian. The, the benefit of this is that the quantum system will stay in the low energy state as long as we vary the Hamiltonian slowly enough. This is the adiabatic principle uh, condition. Um, and so what Paul and I have looked at is implementing the shasterly sutherland lattice into the uh, D-Wave processor lattice and then sampling the equilibrium configuration according to the, um, the phase diagram that we were talking about earlier. So that is to say that we program the Hamiltonian for different regions of that phase diagram and then check to see that the sampling recovers the same statistics. So the first simulation method we use is just called forward annealing. So you start over here at time zero and then you slowly turn on uh, these uh, fields that control the Hamiltonian uh, H of S. So there's an initial Hamiltonian H0 and a final Hamiltonian H1. And H1 is going to represent our Shasterly Sutherland icing model. H0 represents a relatively flat potential surface. So as we drive the, the time forward, we're going to deform that surface, create a minimum in it until we get to the final time, in which case we expect the quantum state to be localized in the ground state of the shasterly sutherland hamiltonian By measuring that state, we get out statistics about what the spins and the magnetization should be. We've also tried a different technique, and this is a, something that's available within the D-Wave processor, where instead of starting over here on this side of the time control, we actually start off in a um, known state of the Hamiltonian and then reverse anneal. So we, we slowly turn off the, the, the Hamiltonian that we're trying to solve and introduce a mixing term and then go forward again. And the benefit of this is that if we happen to start off in a state that is a local minimum, then this reverse annealing process is intended to perform a, a local search around that minimum through this mixing that allows us to eventually find the global minimum. But we may have to repeat this multiple times, and that's exactly what we do. We actually go forwards and backwards, you know, anywhere from, from 100 to 1,000 times. And at the end of that sequence, we then sample the state to see if there was any improvement in the overall energy. Uh, did, did we get closer to the true ground state? Uh, this is something that we call quantum evolution Monte Carlo. 
Now that embedding process, I've actually got to take this unit cell of the Shasterly-Sutherland lattice. Again, here are those dashed uh, interactions on the diagonal and the square uh, that represents the, the square lattice. Embed that into the, the chimera, the, the D-way processor lattice. And you can see these interactions represent the red cubic here. These interactions represent the blue cubic here and so forth. And then generate an entire uh, system of that embedding. And so this is where there's about 5,000, uh, I think it's around 494 if I remember, uh, embedded spins of the Shasterly-Sutherland uh, lattice. And so what you're seeing here are, is actually the Shasterly-Sutherland lattice where the different colors correspond to the different positions in the embedding. What I'll call out is that there are defects, so gaps in this embedding, which are due to the presence of defects within the actual processor, places where it wasn't uh, perfectly aligned. Uh, those turn out to be very significant in the, the physics of, the, um, of the, the device. In particular, these end up looking like open boundaries. And when you're trying to simulate a bulk behavior like magnetization, open boundaries can throw off that calculation. So we actually developed a mean field boundary condition where we basically set a bias only on the qubits located on the boundary, which makes them behave as if they were buried deep inside of the, the lattice itself. So the way to do that is to add an additional um, boundary term to this, this Hamiltonian, but only for those qubits that are located at the, uh, the edges, and then minimize the value of the applied bias that's needed to make the difference between the magnetization on the inside and the magnetization on the boundary as small as possible. So this would turned out to be a very useful technique uh, to uh, actually recover the correct behavior. By doing that embedding and programming of the Hamiltonian, we actually perform a measurement and what we get out is a lattice representation of the spin system. Here, let's say black is spin up and red is spin down. This is actually a sample of the ensemble of states that the, the icing Hamiltonian uh, prepares. Uh, from multiple samplings, we can then estimate the uh, magnetization and the structure factor for that system. Here, structure factor is basically the Fourier transform of the spatial correlation between the spins. In the case of uh, the, anti uh, the ferromagnetic phase, so over here in one, you can see that almost all the spins are pointed in the same direction. There's a few places along the edges where these are uh, uh, flipped, but again, that's near these open boundaries. And so it's a place where our, our, our mean field boundary condition didn't work quite well. In the uh, Neil space, you can see the uh, checkerboard pattern representing the alternating uh, spin dynamics. Again, there's a few places where things don't quite work out perfectly, but again, it tends to be located near the boundary. And then finally, in this uh, fractional plateau phase, we exactly see this kind of frustration where the qubits are uh, patterned in this alternating uh, scheme, but it's an indication that every time one of the qubits is pointed in one direction, there's at least two others nearby pointed in the other direction. Uh, it's not always perfect, there are some defects, but when we average over this uh, ensemble of samples, we actually recover the, the correct magnetization. And so here's an example of it on the left. The, the blue line here corresponds to a classical Monte Carlo simulation of this system, whereas the orange line corresponds to our quantum evolution Monte Carlo. And so you can see that there's a, a, an increase uh, in the magnetization as the field is applied. It plateaus and then it saturates as that field increases. So you go through these kind of two phase transitions uh, as the field is scanned. Over here on the right is that structural factor that describes the correlations within the spin system. And in this regime, you see the four peaks, which actually are characteristic of the frustration between these uh, different spin states. Now, by using these mean field boundary conditions, we're actually able to improve the resolution of those four peaks, they're very well separated, they're nearly the same amplitude and nearly the same symmetry. So it's an indication that the, the, the processor 
is actually getting uh, almost perfect the the reproduction of the um, the, the non-local or the, um, uh, the I'm sorry not not non-local but the the correlations between the individual uh, spin systems. So our next step then is to try and experimentally validate this. Uh, we at the spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge we can actually uh, synthesize these materials, put them in the neutrons, and measure those structural uh, those structure factors, and then compare that with the quantum simulation directly. Um, I think that this is another way that we can benchmark the quantum computers. Now, not so much by doing a comparison with classical simulations, of course we can do that, but by comparing with the actual experimental uh, collection of those measurements as well. In the future, when quantum computers are even more powerful, that'll be the, the, the right way to, to perform this type of uh, you know, uh, comparison. Okay, so the very last topic is, um, the, the idea of quantum supremacy uh, using uh, comparisons with conventional HPC. Of course, this has gotten a lot of attention uh, when Google recently demonstrated that their processor, Sycamore, could perform a problem, uh, solve a problem, uh, random circuit sampling, much faster than the Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge could. Um, this was a major milestone uh, because, as far as I know, it's the first evidence that a quantum computer um, can outperform the, the world's fastest supercomputer. Now, the approach to this is based on random quantum circuit sampling. And you can see in the diagram here at the bottom that the uh, Google, the Sycamore processor, it's a transmon device laid out in a square lattice. And there is a layered approach to generating these random circuits where two uh, body interactions, uh, two qubit interactions are applied randomly between these different uh, uh, five qubits uh, that are available here, the one in the center and the four on the sides. And in between each of those layers are single qubit gates that have been, uh, um, uh, th that have been applied to keep them separated. And based on the depth of this sequence, you get out a distribution of uh, results uh, during your measurement process. And then you want to ask whether or not the classical computer can reproduce that same distribution. Now, the, um, the, the circuit sampling problem and, and how do you actually select these uh, circuits in order to give you the, the best representation uh, and make the problem as hard as possible have all been worked out previously. This was a demonstration of actually running that calculation on the Sycamore chip and comparing it to a similar calculation on the, on the supercomputer. And the way to compare those two is that both calculations will output probability estimates for the individual observations, so the X sub I. So what's the probability to observe X sub I given a specific instance of the random circuit? And you can look at the expectation value of that and cross-correlate the two results between the classical and the quantum system. And this leads to something called the cross-entropy benchmark. Now the cross-entropy benchmark ideally is going to find that these two systems actually give you the same statistical distributions. Well, the problem, of course, is that how long does it take for the classical computer to actually reach a cross-entropy benchmark of a given threshold? So that's to say that I need to perform enough samples on my classical computer that I can match the number of samples performed on the quantum computer and get the same level of uh, estimate for the, the, the cross-entropy benchmark. It turns out, though, that sampling that random quantum circuit on the classical computer is just a hard problem. They knew this going into it. This is exactly why they, they picked that problem. Whereas the quantum computer naturally generates outputs from that random circuit. Now, when we look at the, the summit system, we find that for the 53 qubits in that processor and the number of cycles, so the, the depth of the random circuit being 12 or 14, that you can actually tailor the simulation uh, to figure out how, how, you know, to make it go faster or slower, given how many compute resources you have available. Given the largest number of compute resources available, this calculation was still taking hours on the summit computer. So the 53 qubit uh, depth uh, 14 circuit. 
whereas the quantum processor was taking about 600 seconds to sample that circuit 3 million times. So in order to uh, compare those two, you're spending more and more time on the summit computer as the depth of this sequence is increasing. So this leads you to the, the, the plot you see here. As the number of qubits are increasing, I can compare different depths between my classical and quantum computers, and I can see good agreement between these. And that's an indication that the, the simulation was feasible on the classical computer and giving me more or less the right answer. However, if I increase the number of cycles that is the circuit is actually performing, then I quickly get to the point where my classical computer simply cannot perform that calculation in a reasonable amount of time. By extrapolating out these results, we're able to figure out that the quantum computer was performing these calculations on the order of 200 seconds, whereas the classical computer was going to need anywhere from a few hours to 10,000 years in order to keep up with this type of calculation. And so this is what led to the, the claim of quantum supremacy, is that we were actually able to demonstrate that the classical computer simply can't keep up with quantum computers for this type of problem. So that was the, the last part about the, the supremacy um, uh, uh, work, but I want to kind of put everything in context and wrap, and wrap up. Um, what I've tried to show is that quantum computers are, are, are a really cool new capability that we can apply to scientific computing. Uh, we've looked at the cases of chemistry and material science, and those seem like very good candidates for these early applications. Not necessarily because they're discovering new science yet, but we can compare them to our current methods as a way of monitoring progress in their development. But of course, NIST devices have uh, lots of opportunities to develop new concepts and testing this feasibility as a possible accelerator for future high performance computing systems is what we're looking at Oak Ridge National Lab. So let me just conclude by showing you some of the folks that are, that are working here uh, with me. Uh, here I am over here on the right. Uh, Megan, who's joined us today on the phone, I believe is, uh, is here. She was doing the, the characterization of the GHC state work. Uh, Paul, who worked on the Shasterly Sutherland model is over here. Uh, Dimitri actually was one of the pivotal people working on the simulations of the, the Sycamore system. And then Alex over here is our, our chief developer for the XACCC software that's at the heart of all of our, our benchmarking techniques. Okay, so thank you very much and it's uh, uh, happy to take any more questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Travis, for the very nice uh, and inspiring talk. Uh, yes, so we have time for questions, uh, comments, uh, please. Yeah, sorry to go a little bit long. Uh, the, oh. uh, well, that, that's normal for us. We often discuss okay. that. Yes, I was asking constantly questions, so that's also my fault. <laughs> no problem. Good questions, though. Good questions. Yeah. Uh, Piotr, I think you want to ask something or... Yeah, I mean, maybe comment the 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 model of errors you presented at the beginning. What what I was wondering um, when when you were mentioning Markov Markov chains, mm. have you tested superposition of states or entangled states? That would be way more interesting than just uh, separable uh, computational basis states. So I agree with you on this. Um, the one of the reasons we used the, the separable computational basis states was to interpret the, the, the measurement outcomes. So, so zero, zero maps to any of the four possible outcomes. I think you can do that with the other states as well, but it, but it requires a lot more post-processing and sampling statistics. So um, we, we tried that once with, you know, like the plus state. The plus state goes to zero and one with 50-50 with probability. But then we, we got ourselves into an issue where we were trying to get the error bars down on the 50-50 the probability, j just the sampling uh, error as opposed to the actual noise error. And, and that ended up being a challenge for us. So, so this is one of the reasons we went with the computational states. Okay, thanks. So any, any more questions? I, if there are not any at the moment, I have some, of course. So just 
Okay, regarding the quantum ad advantage, so uh, or supremacy. Uh, of course, you are aware, I mean, many people, I mean, now here we have mostly quantum people on the audience, so we are like sort of quite, I mean, it was a very hot topic. And there was this controversy regarding IBM and like some uh, like further development. So, okay, semi serious question. So, uh, uh, will actually, will you guys like in, in Summit implement this uh, like algorithm that, uh, or algorithm or this other like method that, uh, okay, I, IBM folks propose, or of course there were further developments on the side of classical simulation, right? Some, uh, right. I think beginning of this year, there were some strong work by, okay, I know that Fernando Brandao and Aram Haro yeah. were involved in, in it, right? So what is like the current status for us? So yeah, I mean. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I understand your question. Yeah, the, um, so first the IBM, uh, you know, the, the, this all came out, I think, around October, the, the announcement. And, and IBM made an announcement at that time that they had a proposal to perform a simulation that would, would ideally do this calculation in two and a half days, the, the one that would take um, 10,000 years. Um, we actually evaluated that paper, and we don't think that we could run that calculation on the supercomputer at the moment. Um, so, so there is a feasibility question, but we're actually trying to work with IBM to figure out are there modifications that could make that happen. So, so this is definitely something we're interested in mm -hmm. because, you know, being able to simulate a 53 qubit system in two and a half days is still an enormous effort. Um, I'm not sure that I really want to wait that long. Uh, it, it's still a huge difference over 600 seconds, but it also is an important capability to have for understanding how the quantum device itself is behaving. You know, because what I'm concerned about is that when I get to 54 qubits or 55 qubits, now I have nothing. I have no way of knowing if this device is actually performing correctly. I have to just hope that my engineering is working. And, um, and so if they have that capability, it would be wonderful. Um, the other piece of this, is that I do think that there are approximate uh, simulation techniques that can probably uh, extend this this argument some. You know, here I'm trying I'm using cross entropy benchmark and getting down to a certain level of uh, accuracy in the simulation. Maybe that that's that's too stringent. Maybe I just need to get good enough accuracy to to say that I understand what's happening. Um, I, I think that that maybe where we're headed, but. Uh, but it's not something we can do just yet. Sure, sure, of course. But um, may I just continue a question around this before me as the please, next question? Well. So, uh, but have you read this paper by uh, by uh, Sagadi and the Alibaba team about? Uh, probably it was an approximate version of this. They also have evaluated this IBM proposal. They said it's not feasible like that, but with not two and a half days, but uh, if I remember correctly, they said some 12 days or around 10 days, they say that it's possible perhaps to do this. Have you seen that or have you any comments on this? Oh yeah, no, 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 great point. Yeah, so I think the Alibaba team has, has looked at this a lot. Um, and I remember they had something that came out around the same time, but it was using a slightly different um, layout for the connectivity. And it does turn out that that's an important part for for designing the, um, the simulation methods here. Th these particular methods are based on tensor networks and how you can partition your tensors uh, depends a lot on the layout of the system itself. And so there, the Google has this square lattice. Um, and, I, and if I remember the Alibaba team was doing something about the, the two cubic gates that, that wasn't quite in agreement. Um, but I think you're right that there has been more recent work here. The, the approximation stuff, I'm thinking of especially like Monte Carlo techniques. Um, you know, all the all these simulation methods are in some sense exact. You know, even if they're using tensor networks, they're still trying to get an exact representation of the quantum state. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But but why? I mean, you know, I, I, I my my processor certainly is not exact um, in, in the sense that it, it it has noise in it, and so I only need a pro a, a simulation a model that is within the level of noise in my processor. 
And I, I just don't yet know how you design a simulation technique to do that. Um, but we've looked at some at Monte Carlo, which kind of uses a path integral approach. And the benefit there is I can tune the number of samples I, I, I keep in order to um, get a certain estimate variance, but that is massively parallel. And so, you know, a large high performance computer should be able to do that, that fairly efficiently. Uh, but again, something we've thought about, but not something we've tried yet. Thanks, thanks. So, uh, yep, any more questions to, to Travis? Um, so, if not, I have uh, one more. So, when you presented those results uh, with, that you obtained with D Wave, so you imagine that there, are th those, there were those defects in the, in the layout of the device. So, uh, okay, it's a technical question. Do they, uh, does D-Wave provide the information, like what was the origin of, the, uh, of those defects? So the device was faulty and uh, like D-Wave infor like informs about this or you did some like benchmarking uh, to, to, to get this information? It was it was D-Wave that that um, so the way the devices are made is uh, they have um, they they fabricate the qubits and they're they're laid out in kind of a um, crisscross pattern you know almost like a weave and um, and then they go in and they calibrate each of the the individual qubits and if a qubit fails to meet the calibration standard. Um, you know, maybe there's too much bias or the controls are not, um, have enough range, then they just turn that qubit off. And as a result, you get a hole in the, in the pattern. And those are where the, de the defects are coming from. Um, the, uh, I think in my experience, I've seen one, one chip from D-Wave that has no defects. So, so it is possible to, to get a perfect lattice but almost every other system has, uh, has these types of errors. Um, it's not that the, that the fabrication process failed, it's that the control process failed. Okay, uh, great, thanks. Uh, last chance to ask Travis something, in, at least in this meeting, uh, yeah. Um, okay, if there are no- Can I have a, another no, question? Please. Please. Yeah, you, 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 you were talking about the reverse annealing and your Monte Carlo method. I didn't get it properly. I mean, mm -hmm. kind of understand it, but not really. So can you tell me a little more, more about it? Because I would like to, yeah. to understand it. Oh, yeah. No, no I, I, sorry, I went through this kind of fast. Um, you know, so maybe uh, when I do forward annealing, and when I start off over here at time zero, I'm in this, an eigenstate of this system, which is a uniform superposition of all states. And when I anneal, I then end up in an eigenstate of this system, which is a single computational basis state. So to do reverse annealing, I start off in a single computational basis state. And then I slowly add on the other field term, the transverse field, which introduces some superposition. And so that okay. single computational phase, it starts to explore its local configuration. And then I forward anneal again, and I get out another computational basis state, which may be different. I, I may have increased the probability of getting to lower energy. And then I repeat that process over and over again. And so that's what this diagram is showing is, is it, uh, here I'm in my, my Hamiltonian one. I add a little bit of mixing term and then I go back to Hamiltonian one and then I repeat that process over and over. And the idea is that by adding the mixing term, I'm gonna search this local area and allow tunneling and these other effects to hopefully find a lower energy state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And you, you know, and you can check if it's working because you know the input state and you can, you can calculate its energy. And if I, if I perform this procedure and I find that the state I got out didn't change or maybe it goes up in energy, then I would just reject that state. Uh, so it, it's kind of like a, um, 
um, Monte Carlo sampling procedure. So. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, let us uh, thank uh, Travis uh, again for a very nice talk. Like he covered many topics from like frontiers of yeah uh, present day quantum computing. So that was very nice, at least for me. Thanks, Travis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Very happy yeah. to do so. Uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah, maybe one, yeah, one day we can meet in person. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.